Start with verse 1. That's after second, before second class. <laughs> Are we there yet? Amen. Amen. Second. So at the end of the Bible, New Testament, for Thessalonians. Or, or start with verse 1. Right. Amen. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. Continue in prayer and watching the same with thanksgiving. Amen. With all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bond, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, Amen. that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Amen. All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your heart. With an uh, anathemus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluted you, and Marcus, sister's son of Barnabas, touching whom ye receive commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. And Jesus, which is called Justice, who are the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which has been a comfort unto me. Amen. And I believe that's all that I'll read. The rest of them are just uh, people that have uh, names that no one knows about. But uh, it's a, the main topic, and I had this outlined and circled, and someone read on this in uh, 2017. <laughs> Let your speech be always with grace, Amen. seasoned with salt. salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Amen. Amen. Because there are people that say they give you an answer, but is this really from God, or, or, or do they know exactly what they're talking about? Amen. And you can always give an answer to anybody, but better read this first to know Amen. God before Amen. you answer anything because I, I've had that happen to me, you know. And actually they said, you know, Brother Ray knows more than I do. <coughs> well, I sure hope so. He's a pastor. <laughs> but some people put their self in esteem. That's right. Oh, I'm better That's than right. a pastor. Well, I've heard a few pastors in my lifetime. Never heard anybody second guess that's right a pastor because what's coming out of his mouth is what God told him and, and it, it it should be a, out of the Bible amen and if you second guess that then what are you causing are you Good. causing trouble hearsay blah blah whatever Religion, yes you're right so I always try to keep my mouth shut until somebody makes me mad. <laughs>
<laughs> Give the Lord a hand. Praise God. Amen. If you have your Bibles open to where you were reading, just a little teaching here real quick. If you drop down to verse 14 of chapter 4 there, it does mention a name, and I was hoping that the brother would get to there, but it, it says, let's, let, what's the name? What does it say in 14? The name is Luke, the beloved physician. And Damis greets you. So that's where we get the idea that Luke was a physician because that's where it says Luke, the beloved physician. Luke, the doctor. But you know what? There was somebody greater than Luke. Well, that's Jesus. How many people know that? Praise God. Thank you, sweet Jesus. Good to see you, Brother Mike. Good to see you, uh, Brother Cesario. Praise God. Brother Charlie, if you would come on up and take up the offering tonight. <coughs> Give us God has prospered you tonight. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the meeting tonight. Thank you for this, uh, the all different verses they, they read today. God, give us guidance for your light. You are the light. Jesus Christ is the light. He's the truth. Yes. The only truth. Yes. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless this, this uh, offering. Thank you, sweet Jesus. Would you prefer to be the king? 
Yeah. This camera's running, right? This camera's running, right? This camera's running? Huh? Yeah. This camera's running. This camera's running. Yeah, it's running. It's just my data on here is running slow, though.
Hallelujah. I don't know about you, I'm feeling something. And it's bound to be Jesus. Amen. 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 made the big mistake and I prayed it made me really sick for two days because I knew I just obeyed the Lord I was supposed to make a visit and I didn't and the next time I seen the guy he was in the coffin which was my son-in-law and this morning I got a call from Gary and he said what you gonna do I said well first of all I gotta go drug one he says, when you go to Jerry Mark, would you please come and pray for me? I went. <laughs> this time, Sister Mary, I went. And I'm glad I did. As I walked in, he was, he was just so much in, in pain that he was almost in tears. So, we got to praying. And I, you're prayer warriors, are praying for people. Have you ever been praying for somebody and all at once, you went dead, and you didn't know what to do but lean on Jesus. Have you done that, Mary? Okay. I've done it before, but it ain't happened in a long time. I was praying, he was praying, I was praying, and all at once, I can pray, I didn't have it. But all of a sudden, I said, Lord, help me. All of a sudden, that Holy Ghost came down, whoo! And I began to pray in tongues. Ooh, and you talk about the power of falling. I walked that floor over in his house. And I said, Lord, in the name of Jesus, put that devil out of here. Take that pain away from that young man and put it out the door. Amen. I was mad. Because the devil thought he had me. And oh, Jesus swept by just. He passed by. Just, to work just in case. In time. And I began to keep on in prayer and pray and it got real strong, real strong, stronger. I said, thank you, Jesus. But 
when I got finished, see there's prayer in the Holy Ghost, and there's some that, that ain't supposed to be interpreted. So I had to tell uh, Gary this. Now, Gary, that was in tongues. It was the Holy Ghost. But it wasn't nothing to be interpreted. It was to bring the power of the healing down on him. See, I knew it. And he says, yeah, because he's not bad about if he hears the message in tongues. He thinks it's interpreted. Well, some is. There is a message to be interpreted, but that wasn't to be interpreted. Right. And there was, a, there was a praise in the Holy Spirit that you don't interpret. There was a praise that you praise in tongues. It's, it's to, between you and the good Lord. It's not to be interpreted. But then there's a message that can come through in the Holy Ghost, a message to church, and then you interpret that. Or if you can't interpret, keep your little lips zip because it's not going to be right. Because the people aren't going to know what you're talking about. But in the Holy Ghost, in the prayer, then God will give either you or somebody in the congregation an interpretation. Amen. That's all Amen. I have to say. That's right. Give the Lord a hand. Praise God. <laughs> you know, anybody that has walked this walk for a while, when God tells you to do something, better do it. Because he'll let you know you should have done it if you don't do it. Brother Charlie, stand up and give praises to God. Testify before we get started here. Lord Jesus, thank you another day of life. Thank you for your grace today. Amen. And every single Amen. day of my life. Thank you for the change Thank you, Lord, that yes. you make possible yes. through of me. Now I'm with you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm serving you, Lord. Thank you, sweet And Jesus. I serve you a hundred percent, Lord. You. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the brothers you, and sisters in this congregation. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity they given me to be a, a, a message in, in, in this congregation, Lord. And we love you, Lord. We love you. We need you every Thank single you, day of our life, Lord. You are the, the omega and the, the beginning and the end, the omega Amen. and the alpha. Amen. Lord Jesus, we love you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before I forget, I should have made an announcement earlier. Let's keep uh, Praise and Worship Church, Brother Monday's Church, lives up in prayer. They're going to be going through, I'm sure, a lot of changes coming up. Bobby Bryant, which is an evangelist that's been there and here a number of times, I've known him for about 10 years now, he's going to be at Praise and Worship on the 30th of September which is a Wednesday, the last day of September. They don't normally have a, set, a Wednesday service anymore, but they're going to have a special service because he'll be in town ministering. The reason why I'm pointing that out, I want our church to support them in prayer. And if we can physically go there to also support them to be there also for the evangelist, <coughs> I think that'd be a great gesture. The next night, is October 1st, which is Thursday, our church night at 7 o'clock here. And uh, Brother Bobby had called me, and he had just gotten off the phone from Brother Charles. And before he could finish asking me, I said, just be ready with your message on, on Thursday. So he's going to be ministering the next night here. And the people at Praise and Worship had already talked to me today, and most of them said they would be here Thursday night. So let's try to embrace them. Let's try to pray for them. Uh, they're just going to be going through a lot. So let's keep them lifted up in prayer. Praise God. Amen. I have a message since I'm on Facebook there, and it's not just to the church, it's to everyone that's out there. If you don't have a church that you're going to, get into church. You cannot honor God the way you think you can by staying at home. Right. The lie of the devil is that I'm a Christian, I'm saved, I've been baptized, and I don't need to go to a building. Well, we are the church who we're to assemble ourselves somewhere with other 
like-minded Christians. Yeah. The Bible says, do not forsake assembling yourselves, as many of you have. Find a good church to go to. There's many of them out there. If you're in the city of Elyria or city of Lorraine, I think there's about two at every, three, every street corner. There's churches out there that are waiting for you to go to. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, you don't have to be a member of a church. You just walk through those doors. I don't care what your life is like or what you've done or think you've done or what you're about to do. Go to church. Go to church somewhere. And I pray that you hear a good word preached. I pray that you hear a Holy Ghost message from the preacher or teacher, whoever is doing it. I pray that your heart be changed. I believe that most of us that are in here we're not looking for the Lord. I wasn't looking for the Lord when I went to church. I went to church out of curiosity to check it out, to see why the other people were going there. I did not have a plan to give my heart to Jesus Christ. Furthest thing from my mind. But a number of months later, Brother Alex, guess what? Jesus got a hold of me, and he wouldn't let go, and I didn't let go of him. So get into church somewhere, people. Don't believe this lie that you can stay at home and worship God. Don't believe this lie that, that churches are full of hypocrites. Churches are not perfect. There's faults in every church. There's bad in every church. But praise be to God, there's good and holiness in every church, too. Amen. Find a good church to go to, praise God. Well, if you will, lift up your Bibles, praise God. If you need some, there's some in the pews. Repeat after me with conviction, with boldness. You should know it by heart by now. This is my Bible. This is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. This is the invalid word of God. Jesus is the word. This is the good news, the good report, the sound doctrine. This is what I believe in, stand on, live by, and trust in. Thank you, Lord, for your holy word. Give the Lord a hand. Amen. I'm not going to keep you long. We've already had a lot of good things said today. We've already had church. When I, when I get a little nugget, I've already had church. But I want to get two or three nuggets, praise God. So I, I pray that what you've already heard through songs and through testimonies and through prayer and through the reading of the Word, I pray that you've already received something tonight. And I'm going to say this until I can't say it any longer. You know what? It's up to us to receive. It's up to us to expect something. You know, I don't go to church to be entertained. I don't go to church just to hear certain ministers and preachers and pastors. I go to church to receive something. Praise God. I don't care if it's our own church here, or if it's a church down the road, or across state or in another state. When you go to church, it's not up to the pastor, the preachers, the teachers to get you excited. It's not up to, to them. And so many times I've visited churches in the past, and, and I used to walk out with my head just shaking, you know. And people say, well, man, I, you know, I want to get something today. Pastor, get me excited. Preacher, get me excited tonight. It's not the preacher's job to do that. I've heard some of the best messages come out of very quiet men, very quiet ladies. No jumping, no shouting. Maybe just reading a scripture or two and maybe talking about that scripture or two. But the power of God was there and the message was received. This ain't a football game. It's not a movie theater. We're not a nightclub. We're not here to entertain. We're here to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ for lives, Sister Mary, to be changed. Hearts to be touched. That's why we're here. And as I said before we started our service, more than now than ever, I don't care how old or young you are, we have to make a stand in telling the world what we stand for and who we are. That we are Christians, and here's the principles in which the Christians live by. My daughter asked me the other day, what does conform mean? Do not be conformed to this world. I said, do not become like this world. When you conform something, you change it into its likeness. The world wants to change the church. The world wants to change us, Brother Tony. Yeah. The world wants to change us to believe in what they believe. The, children, or the world wants us to act like they want to act. That's why churches today, you have, 
you have dark churches and you have lights going off and laser lights and smoke in the background. Crucifix crosses have been removed. Pews have been removed. And it's more like a nightclub than it looks like a church. <laughs> Don't preach about sin. That's going to scare people off. Don't talk about the remission of sin. Don't talk about repenting. That's too hard. We want them to come in so they'll come in and pay their tithes and offerings. Don't talk about the blood. I delivered a meal to one of our sisters yesterday, Sister Carol, and she called me five minutes later after I dropped off the food. And she said, Brother Ray, can you copy CDs? I said, yes, I can. She goes, I want you to copy a CD I just got in. They're all blood songs. You know what I mean by that? I said, yes, I do, sis. She goes, you sing some blood songs at your church, don't you? I said, you know we do. So she goes, I knew that. So she goes, will you copy that CD and get as many as you want for yourself and just bring my original back? I want you to have a copy, but I didn't have enough money to buy you one, but I got one for myself, and if you can make a copy, you can have it. I said, well, I'll do that, sis. So we're going to have some blood songs copied in here, praise God. We already have them in the song books and elsewhere. But we talk about the blood of Jesus Christ here. Amen. The blood of Jesus Christ, Brother Mike, that's what washed away my sins. Washed away your sins. This isn't the message tonight, but just want to put a little maybe icing on the cake here. The message will be short, I promise. Sister Geneva says that means it's 35 minutes at least more. <laughs> But I want you to turn tonight, if you will, to the Gospel of Luke, second chapter. And I'm going to start probably with verse 41. What's happened is that Jesus has come on the scene. He's been born. He is now about 12 years old. And as with the custom, once a year the family would go to Jerusalem at the Feast of Passover, which was their custom. And when they went, Brother Kevin, they didn't just go by themselves. They took everybody. The nieces, the nephews went, the cousins went, the sisters, the brothers went. The whole family went. You went as a caravan. So it almost like saying, let's get all our families together and the church together. And, and, and Brother Alice, we're all going to go to Cleveland for this service. Well, they were on their way to Jerusalem, and they made it to Jerusalem at Passover. So they had kids all over. Jesus was there. He probably had other cousins and nieces and nephews that were younger and older than him running around. And we're going to start with verse 41, and listen to this. It said, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, speaking of Jesus, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. In other words, he stayed behind. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. See, there were so many kids, so many family members, when they started to leave town, they thought Jesus was with the rest of the kids playing. They didn't know that he stayed behind. And 44 says, but they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinfolk and acquaintances. I can see her heart beating. Have you ever lost your child for a second? Has that ever happened to you? I remember, and this is a terrible story, and I'm almost ashamed to say it. I had to work a booth at the Wayne County Fair one year. And this is going back about 22 years ago, 21 years. And the year before, actually it was the same year, there was a girl that was picked up from that fair, and she was murdered and killed by a gentleman that was a little deranged and had just gotten out of jail. And that same time, my little daughter wanted to ride some kitty rides. And I let her go ride some kitty rides, and I can see her at a distance, and I'm over here. Well, I look back over here, and guess who I don't see anymore? I don't see Tabitha, my little girl. 
And my heart is just beating out of his chest. And I'm running all over, and I'm looking here and looking there. And, Have you seen a little girl? Have you seen a little girl? Have you seen a little girl? And then I hear her half crying, and she's over on the other side. Daddy, daddy. And I went over and got her. When you don't find your kid, you get nervous. You should get nervous. I think all of us, our hearts would be pounding. How many times have you been to a, a grocery store? Or, I, I remember many times my mother used to, man, she'd just shout at the top of the lunch, where are you, Tom? Where are you, right? We'd go to Hill's department store. That was the only department store in Ashtabula at the time. And we'd go through the clothes. You know how you go through the clothes? They're going through corn stalks. But we'd play in the clothes, and, and if she didn't follow the clothes moving around, we'd get lost in it. And she would tan our behinds, to be honest with you, when she caught up to us. She said, stay here. But now i got to tell you a funny story. That same mother, with her sister and her first cousin, took me to a store called Newberry's, Five and Dimes. Some of you might remember the old Newberry's. And Newberry was kind of set up like Woolworth's, the old Woolworth's. And they had a little place where you had the little crocodiles, the little turtles, and the birds. And some of them would be in the back of the store. But this one in Ashtabula was in the front of the store, right in front of the big windows and the cashier. So I'm about four years old, three and a half around there. And my mother... Sister Carol takes me to the store with her sister and her first cousin, and they're doing what ladies do, and they're shopping, and my mom says, why don't you just go and look at the animals? So I went and looked at the little birds and the turtles over there, and they used to sell the little crocodiles. And remember that little alligator she could buy back in the day? Real little alligators back in the day. I'm looking at them, and the next thing I see, I'm looking at the window, and there's my mom, my aunt, my mom's cousin, they got some bags, and all three of them are going out to the car. I remember running up to the car, putting my little nose on that window. I'm going, Mommy, Mommy. And Brother Barry, they pull out and they drive out. I'm screaming my head off as a kid, because I knew my heart was pumping as a kid. My mother's leaving me. I figured she would have, her heart would have been pumping because she can't find me. Well, she forgot about me. <laughs> and they went all the way home, which wasn't that far, about four or five miles, got into the house, put some coffee on the stove to get the coffee made back in the day. Then by the time they're sitting down drinking their coffee, they're looking around saying, where's Ray? I'm back at the store with my face still out the window crying. I remember this gentleman, he looked like a, a giant, skinny as a snake, giant. I remember he had black pants, a white short sleeve shirt, and a little black tie. The manager of the store came over and said, Son, what's wrong? And my mom's left me. What's your name? I don't know. Where do you live? I don't know. I'm just bawling my eyes out. Eventually, my mother pulled in with her cousin, her sister, my aunt. And we still laugh about that story. But when we lose a child in a store, when we lose a child and can't find our child, our heart goes a thumping. I think that was happening to Mary. I think that was happening to Joseph, who we know was really the stepfather of Jesus. Where's Jesus? I thought he was with the rest of the kids. We're already a day down the road. Where, where is he at? You mean you haven't seen him at all? The only place he could be, he's got to be back in Jerusalem. So they head back to Jerusalem and listen to what it says here. 45 says, and when they had not found him, they turned back to Jerusalem seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, three days of searching for this boy, three days of searching for young Jesus, they found him in the temple. They found him in the temple. In other words, they found him in church. Yeah. He wasn't playing with the other kids in town. He wasn't in the local inn or the local store or the local shops. And they had him back in those days. He was at the temple. He was at church, sitting in the midst of the doctors. Listen to this. Both hearing them, he was hearing them teach. Both hearing them and asking them what? Questions. His little mind wanted to absorb whatever he could learn. And listen to what it's here in 47. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. He wasn't just listening. He just was, wasn't just hearing them and asking questions. He had answers himself. 
He was amazing, these people. Here's a young kid, 12 years old, and he's sitting here with the doctors, the teachers, the priests. He's hearing the, the word being taught. He's hearing, he, he, he's hearing God's message through his word here. He's asking questions. And this boy has such a great understanding of the word of God. Well, there was a good reason why he had an understanding. Even though he was an earth form, he was the son of God. But listen to what it says here. 48 says, And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father, I have sought thee sorrowing. We were really upset, son. What were you? Why did you do this to us? We were truly upset. And listen to what 49 says. And this is what Jesus said. And Jesus said unto them, how is it that you sought me? Wish ye not that I, listen to this, I must be about my father's business. Yes. And they understood not. They didn't understand. And they understood not the saying which he spoke unto them. And he went down with them. And he was an obedient child. This was the will of his heavenly father. And he was obedient. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. He was subject to his stepfather and his mother. He was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And 52 says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Three things we learn when Jesus said, I'm about my father's business. Number one, he knew his identity. He knew who he was. I'm about my father's business. We need to know our identity. Brother Nelson had a great talk the other day. It was just a few minutes. I wish he would have went on Sunday. He was talking about who we is in Christ, who we are in Christ. Who's our identity in Christ? Jesus knew his identity. You know, when we were just talking about this in Bible study the other day in 1 John, listen to what it says in John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God and daughters of God to them that believe in his name. When you have a born-again experience, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you become a son and daughter of God. That's the misconception of the modern-day church world. They think if they go to church and, and, and they're singing songs and they're praising God, they're their son and daughter of God. No, God loves them. He loved everybody so much he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. But in order to become a son of God, to become a daughter of God, you have to be a child of God. And just because we're alive doesn't mean we're a child of God. To become a child of God, we have to have a born-again experience. To become a child of God, we have to receive him into our life. Amen. Just like receiving him into the boat, we have to gladly receive him. Willingly receive him. And once we made him Lord of our life, God of our life, and not do it with a mouth, Jesus was repeating from the Old Testament, he says, many, many praise me, many honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from it. When we truly are not giving him lip service, but truly giving him heart service, that's when we'll experience the born again experience. That's when we truly become his. And once you become his, Sister Genia, it's easy to go about and do the Father's business. It's easy to do the Father's business. Galatians 3.26 says this, Ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. By believing in Jesus Christ, Alex, and surrendering to Him, you become a child of God. And isn't that great? Here's your identity. Just like young Jesus at 12 years old, He knew who He was. Can you imagine Joseph being there? What Joseph would have thought? And the Bible said both of them, and Mary too at first, didn't understand what he was talking about. You know? How be I'm going about my father's business? Joseph is a carpenter. The Bible talks about that. Jesus would have been an apprentice to him. And Joseph says, what do you mean he's going about my business? He's not making anything out of wood. He's not at the shop. <coughs> We're a long ways from home. What is he talking about? They didn't understand but see, he wasn't talking about a stepfather. He was talking about God Almighty, his Heavenly Father. I'm doing my father's business. I, I need to be here. I, I need to listen. I, I, I need to learn. I need to ask questions. And I, 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 need, I need to express some thoughts too. 
that brought me to the story today when I was reading this earlier this morning about Mary, Martha's sister. They went to the house and they were going to have a meal, but Martha's the only one in the kitchen working. Martha's the only one working. And I always joke around. I can see Sister Joyce back there throwing pots and pans and getting the macaroni salad and all that. Say, where's that Mary? Mary, where are you? Mary, where are you? And Mary's in having church service. She's at the feet of Jesus. She's having a church service. They're listening to Jesus preach and Jesus talk. And that's what young Jesus was doing. He was in the temple to hear the Father's words that were being, that were being spoken of through the Bible at that time, through what they had in the Bible. When he was asking questions, he was where he needed to be. Mary, in that story, was where she was needed to be. Martha walked up to Jesus and said, Jesus, I'm here slaving like a dog, making the macaroni salad, made the coffee three times, dropped the biscuits twice. <laughs> and lazy Mary is in here listening to the church service. Tell her to get herself up and get in that kitchen. And what did Jesus say to Martha? Martha, Martha. Whenever he says your name twice, watch out. Martha, Martha. Geneva, Geneva, listen to me this time. Martha, Martha. Why are you so troubled? Mary's doing what she needs to do. She's doing the most important thing right now. She's not making the dinner. She's listening to the words of me. She's listening to the words of God Almighty. So here this 12-year-old lad that we call young Jesus is listening to the words that you could say that he actually wrote himself many years ago and inspired men to work and, and list those words down. We all know from our studies Jesus was around long before he became a baby. He was around from the beginning of time. But now he's going about his father's business. So know who you are. Know who you are and know your heart. He had a heart to learn. He had a heart to stay there. Some would say he's 12 years old. Wouldn't he be afraid his mom is gone, his stepfather is gone, his nieces, his nephews, his cousins are all gone. The whole caravan, they were headed back a whole day, and here's three days later, they finally found him. But you know what? He wasn't crying. He didn't have his nose up to a glass plate window. He, he, he wasn't screaming because you know what? He started to understand who his true father was. My true father is God Almighty. My mom might be gone, my, my stepdad might be gone, my, my, my nieces, my nephews, my cousins might be gone. The caravan is gone. It's been gone three days, but I'm not afraid because I'm in where I need to be. I'm here with God's people, and my Father is God Almighty. Amen. And I'm protected by Him. He had no fear. We had no fear. We should never fear. We are children of God. But what happens is that we run, we cower, and we're afraid of this, afraid of that. We're afraid of death. We're afraid of sickness. We're afraid of loss. We're afraid of poverty. We're afraid of the virus. We need to sometimes stand up boldly and say, you know what? Doesn't matter what comes my way, I'm going to make it through because God is with me. God is with me. How many times has he said, fear not. Be not dismayed. Take courage. Even in the battles, take courage, be not afraid. There's an army out there with swords that can chop my head off, my body apart, that can kill me. But God is saying, not be afraid. And in those battles, guess what? Many people died. Many people died. Good people of God died. How could that be, Brother Ray? The rain falls in the just and the unjust, and the rain falls in the just and the unjust. When there's a battle, there's always going to be casualties on both sides. And even as God's people will have casualties. But see, here's our hope. Here's our hope, just like Brother Monday today. You know what? He wasn't laying in that casket. He was in a place that we call heaven. And you know what? If we die in the battle, guess what? We have a home in heaven, Sister Carol. We have a home there. That's glory life. That's beautiful life. Tony, that's where we're going to be one day. And for the ones that are left behind, we'll sorrow. We'll cry. We'll miss the one that's been gone. I'm sure you know your husband has been gone a number of years, uh, Janine, but I, 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 I know that you probably wish he was here today, tonight, to go home to, praise God. But the glory is this. The glory is that to give God glory. 
when we shut these eyes and we die in the battle, and we are in the battlefield right now more than we ever have been in history. When we die, when we're gone from here, guess what? We didn't die in vain because we're going to be with our loved ones one day. Amen. We're going to have a place called heaven. He's prepared a place for us. And as i said many a time, our, our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Thank you, sweet Lord. Thank you, sweet Jesus. Last thing, he was concerned about doing the Father's business. When you're doing the Father's business, you're not doing things just because you want to. When you're doing the Father's business, you're being led by the Holy Spirit. Today, Sister Geneva, I believe you're doing the Father's business. When we go to the nursing homes, we're doing the Father's business. When we cook, Sister Mary, sir, Sister Joyce, we're doing the Father's business. When we come to church, praise God, Brother Barry has a desire to come to church and serve the Lord. He's doing the Father's business. When you came to church tonight, Brother Tony and Sister Carol, you're doing the Father's business. It was good for a good enough for a 12 year old boy to come to church. We ought to come to church, right? right. We're doing the Father's business. When we prayed for somebody over the telephone, we're doing the Father's business. A week and a half ago, I got a call. I haven't gotten a call that late in a long time. It's 3 30 in the morning. Somebody needed prayer. I answered the phone. I'm doing the Father's business. Tabitha started to come up the steps last night. She got halfway up and she said, Dad, and she saw my hand go up like this to tell her to be quiet. I'm praying for somebody. We're doing the Father's business. When you deliver food or clothing or money to somebody that you feel like to, you're doing the Father's business. Amen. Jesus, when he was at the garden, the night that they took him, the garden of Gethsemane, it said that he prayed so hard that it actually, blood came from his eyes, around his eyes in his face. And in and, 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 and medical science, it says you can actually do such an intense prayer and stuff that the capillaries of your, 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 your face can actually burst and blood can come. And he said, Father, if there would be any way to do this, you would take this cup from me. But nevertheless, let your will be done, not mine. And that's what we should do in our walk every day. I want to do it this way. But Lord, let me humble myself. What would you have me do? What is your will? Are we doing the Father's business? The Bible says to examine not your brother, but to examine herself. Are we doing the Father's business? When we start asking ourselves that question, it puts ourselves in check. We don't have to have somebody check us. We don't have to have somebody say what we're doing right or wrong. The Holy Ghost is going to convict you if you're doing something wrong. He'll lead and guide you in all truths. He does his job very well. That's why sometimes we're jumping and saying amen, and other times we're saying, ooh, me, ouch. That's me. And we joke about it in church sometimes. And the Holy Ghost God that convicted me a little bit. We're all guilty of it. But see, that's his job. That's his job. We need to be pricked sometimes in our heart, our spirit, to get off our, 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 our little mountain that we think we're on sometimes. To say, you know what, maybe I should not have done that. Or maybe I should have done this. Because that wasn't the Father's will, that was my will. But if I'm doing the Father's will, I'm doing my Father's business. And the Bible says this, I'm going to try to quote this in Matthew. It talks about, and I'm going to probably have to paraphrase this, but it, but, but it talks about the ones that are His are the ones that do the will of the Father. And right after that it says, there will be many in that time that will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these great and mighty things in your name? And the Lord will turn to them and say, 
Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I knew you not. See, it's not doing just the work of God. But see, the will of God is having the heart of God. Just because I'm helping someone doesn't mean my heart's into it. Just because I'm volunteering to do something doesn't mean my heart's into it. See, we can't earn our way into heaven. We can't, it doesn't matter how much we preach up here. We can't preach our way into heaven. It doesn't matter if many people get saved. Well, a person not right, they can't get saved. Well, Billy Graham got saved at the age of 17 by a backslidden preacher. Nobody knew it at the time. But see, it wasn't the preacher. It was the words of God coming through. His words will go forth and accomplish what was intended to do. Doesn't matter how much we sing. Doesn't matter how much we testify. Doesn't matter if we can jump four feet in the air. Doesn't matter if we hit every nursing home in this county and the next county over. Doesn't matter if we fed everybody in the county. That doesn't get us into heaven. What gets us into heaven is having the right heart for Him. Doing the work of my Father because I'm doing His will. And why am I doing His will? Because I love Him. We all, most of us have had a natural father or mother, I pray. Some of us may not have it the best mothers and fathers, but most of us have. I thank God I had a good father. I thank God I had a good mother, and they're still here on earth with me. And I tried to do my best, and still do, at 65 years of age, to please my father and my mother. And that's all God wants you to do, is to please him. See, that's why he says, you know, don't worry about burning the idols. Don't worry about all the things you think you have to sacrifice for me and do. He says, obedience is better than sacrifice. What am I telling you to do? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your enemies. Hold your enemies. Tony, if your enemy slaps your face, turn the other cheek. Now we think that's hard to do, but that's what he said to do. If you want your coat, give it to them. I've had things from money to merchandise to radios to cameras stolen from me. And it used to just drive me crazy because I worked hard to get what I wanted. So if it's gone, now I say, you know what, Lord, evidently he needed it more than I did or she needed it more than I did. Bless him with it. It's a change of heart. doesn't mean we're happy all the time, but it's a change of heart. I got some Bibles coming in in a few weeks, so I actually should be here next week. Got some new pew Bibles, King James put in the pews here. And I started to think, what if we all had just an extra Bible, not to give away, but just to have in our car, brand new, still in the wrapper, never open it up, just have it in plain sight in case somebody wanted to seal that Bible. Now, the reason why I'm saying that, you know the Bible is the most stolen book in the United States in the world today? Still is? Now, they're normally stolen from bookstores and also from hotel rooms. Hotel yeah. right. <laughs> but, what if someone took that nice new Bible and wrapped it up? And maybe one day opened up that Word of God. Now, we might not believe the Word of God can convict that thief, but it can I'll just leave you with this story. God's already done what he's going to do tonight. We had a gentleman from Gideon Bible come over to praise and worship a few years ago when I was there. And he had the morning service, and he talked about his organization handing out the, the, the Bibles, the Gideon Bibles. And he said there was a time you could walk on the school property and give it to the kids. In fact, I remember getting one as a child. But he says, now with the laws and all that, we can't walk on the school property. We have to walk on the outside of the schools. But as the kids walk by, we can hand them a Bible. And he said, we used to put them in all the motel rooms. A lot of the motels won't accept them now. That's how much our world is changing. Yeah. They're free Bibles, but the motels don't want them anymore. Now, that says something about our society. But he has stories upon stories about couples that were going to hurt each other 
kill each other, get a divorce. One gentleman was in he, uh, not, the night he, he never went to church. He was actually going to commit suicide that night. He was having problems at home. And he opened up the Bible and he started to read the Bible. He started to read, read about God loving the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. And he continued to read and continued to read and continued to read. He said, I don't even know if you're true or not, God, if you exist. But he said he could not lay that Bible down. He read to morning time till the light came. And he never took his life. After he left that room the next day, he started to find a local church and go to the church. And within about two weeks, he gave his heart to Jesus Christ. And he testifies all over the United States today how he was going to commit suicide. But because a Bible was left in a room at a hotel or a motel, he picked it up and started to read it. That's how powerful God's holy word is. It changes lives. And for all of us that are kind of seasoned, have been around, when I want comfort, I don't turn on the TV set. When I want comfort, I don't turn on the radio. And I love music, especially Christian music. When I need peace in my spirit, I get into God's holy word. So the message tonight is are we doing the work of the Father? And as I continue to say here in that last verse in 52, Jesus, and we could say this too, we could put our own names in here. Rose, Barry, Joyce, Mary, Geneva, increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with man. The more that we have Jesus in us, the more that we have God Almighty in us, the more we have the Word of God in us, the more we go about the Father's business, and it goes hand in hand because we can't do the Father's business unless we have Him in us. We can't keep the Father's business unless we're getting into the Word. See, the more we get into the Word, that's nourishment for us. That's where people, the world doesn't understand that anymore. How many times, I read the Bible five years ago all the way through. Or I read it 20 years ago all the way through. One time I read it four times all the way through years ago when I was young. You know what? I ate 10 years ago too. <laughs> I've had to eat many meals after that. And you don't get a stomach like this not by eating, not eating. <laughs> that wasn't the line that much. <laughs> but the point is, I had breakfast today. After the service today, I went back and made a lunch. I'll probably go back home and eat some more tonight. It's something that we do all the time. I need natural food. But more important than that, Brother Tony, we need manna from heaven. We need the Word of God to eat and take into our hearts. But we need to do it more than once a week. We need to do it every day of our lives. Praise God. We all stand tonight. Thank you, sweet Jesus.